Last year, I was given a book by my friend and colleague, Britt Van Oyen, a book written by Franz de Waal called The Age of Empathy. It had been published quite a few years earlier, but the little paperback book I'd got was a new edition. And I read it, and it has had a profound effect on me and the way I think uh, about the world that I inhabit, the world of leadership development, leadership education, helping organizations develop their leadership talent. And it's had a profound effect because throughout the book, Franz shares his work that he's done with primates, but also the work that others have done with primates and with other animals around trying to understand um, the part that empathy plays in both ourselves as human beings, but also in all the various animals uh, that, that he and his colleagues have studied. And what he demonstrates so clearly in the book is that empathy is something that goes way, way back to the beginning of life. It's not a, a new gimmicky thing that we've adopted. It's not something that has been imbibed into us or educated into us, but just exists in all of us. It is a fundamental part of our human nature, but also of the nature of, of animals as well. And with that sort of thought, I also found myself recently becoming more and more frustrated and annoyed about a whole range of things that seem to be happening around the world, awful things for all sorts of different reasons, which we seem to be unable to stop. We seem to say all the right words, shed crocodile tears perhaps, but nothing much alters. And I found myself sort of arguing internally about, you know, well, why don't the United Nations step in? Why doesn't our government do something? Why don't, doesn't the EU do something? Why don't large organizations, global conglomerates do something? And I realized that actually when you look back on all of the things that have happened, all of the good things that have happened uh, to us in this world, nearly all of the occasions have been initiated by an individual, by just one person saying, or, or two or three people saying, enough is enough. We need to do something. We don't know what, but we're going to do something. And uh, a few weeks ago, uh, on Holocaust Day, the rabbis in the United Kingdom, who would normally have used the day to uh, make us all aware and continue to be aware of the terrible, terrible things that happened in Europe in 1930 and in the 1940s to the Jewish communities, use the occasion to actually raise their concerns about what was happening to the Ouijas in Western China. And there had been quite a lot of news about the Rohingyas in Burma and the awful things that happened, the genocide that happened last year when their villages were burnt and they were forced to flee into, into neighboring Bangladesh. And then there was also a number of sort of other elements that came into my thoughts. There was a, a, a wonderful article by a journalist called Simon Tisdall in The Observer a few weeks ago, the, the Observer being a Sunday newspaper in the United Kingdom. And the title of the article, I'm gonna quote it, was the world's bad guys are winning. Is anyone going to stand up to them? And then I suppose finally, watching Orla Gerlin, the Irish journalist who works for the BBC, watching and listening to her reports from the Yemen, a country that's had a civil war that's lasted longer than the Second World War did, where numerous, numerous children and women have been bombed and killed and had their lives completely destroyed because two parties don't seem to be able to talk to each other. And yet both those parties are supported by powerful voices around the world who for whatever reason seem on intent on continuing this murder and this chaos and this destruction. And Orla interviewed a little boy called Ahmed. It was on the BBC television and there'll be a link with this little bit of recording that I'm doing. And Ahmed 
is nine and blind from birth. And there he is teaching his fellow students and children about the Quran and about science. In a building that we wouldn't recognize as a school, it looks like a construction site that has been blown up. And that's exactly what it is. Bits of steel, bits of concrete, no walls, no running water, nothing, no power. Just a lot of young children each day determined to get to school. And I thought there's an element of real, real leadership in what Ahmed is doing. No one told him to do it. No one pushed him to do it. No one's paying him to do it. He just decided that he wanted to do it. He wanted to help the other friends in his class carry on their learning in the most awful circumstances. And when you know that in all of these situations, there are powerful voices, there are organizations, there are international bodies that could do something about it, but seem completely unable to do so, who seem to be unable to show any empathy for what is happening. Professor Michael West, in one of the conversations we had last year, has, has championed the cause of compassionate leadership. There is no compassion. There's compassion that Ahmed has. There's compassion that aid workers have, that nurses have in hospitals, that uh, community leaders have around the world. But where is the compassion and the empathy when we get to the sort of really, really big institutions and organizations and the different political um, structures that exist. And so I thought even more about Ahmed. And I looked back and I thought Rosa Parks in Montgomery on the bus. And I thought of um, Marriott uh, Maguire and Betty Williams and Karen McCowan, who started the Women's Peace Movement in Northern Ireland, who'd had enough who just went out and did something. And I thought, where in all of the teaching and all of the education that I've been involved in, do we talk about moral leadership? Do we talk about empathetic leadership? And do we talk about those things that are really, really important? Because if leadership is a social um, behavior, it, it requires, by its very nature, it requires a community, it requires a group, it requires a team in order for leadership to be expressed. Where is the role of the individual? How do we encourage all of us to step forward and say, on any occasion, in any situation, in the workplace, in our communities, in our societies, maybe in the international dilemmas that I've mentioned, where is the leadership that says enough is enough? We need to move from just thinking about these things to actually doing something about it. And that takes me back to Franz de Waal's book, because right at the end of the book, right on the very last two pages, he says some very profound things that I'd just like to share with you, because I think this is why the book has had such an impact on me. And the first is a story about Abraham Lincoln, the US president, who's making a journey on a boat down the Ohio River with a friend of his who back in that time was a slave owner, something we've heard a lot about recently through Black Lives Matters and some of the movements that have happened here in the United Kingdom. And he writes, another example of how empathy figures into public policy debates concerns abolitionism. Again, the impetus came not just from imagining how bad slavery was, but from the first-hand observation of its cruelty. Abraham Lincoln was plagued by negative feelings as he explained in a letter to a slave-owning friend in Kentucky. In 1841, you and I together took a tedious low water trip on a steamboat from Louisville to St. Louis. You may remember, as well I do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were on board 10 or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continued torment to me. And I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio or any other slave border. 
it is a thing which has and continually exercises the power of making me miserable. So what makes us miserable? And what's then, what does that do then to influence the actions we take? All of us, all of us, if we put our minds to it, all of those involved in education, involved in the work that I do, leadership development, business schools, universities, large organizations, could rebuild that school in the Yemen tomorrow morning. We have the resources to do it. Do we have the leadership to do it? Ahmed asked for a school that would be sufficient to stop the rain from coming in, to shut out the noise of the bullets and the gunfire. If we're truly able to show empathy, then it says something to me about we could make a change. We could do something different. We could, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, think about these things and things that have the power, the power of making us feel miserable and doing something about it. And Franz de Waal goes on in the very last chapter in his book, obviously how to achieve Empathy cannot be easily inferred from watching animal communities or even small scale human societies. The world we live in is infinitely larger and more complex. We need to rely on our well developed intellect to figure out how to balance individual and collective interests on such a scale. But one instrument that we do have available and that greatly enriches our thinking has been selected over the ages meaning that it has been tested over and over with regard to its survival value. That is our capacity to connect and to understand others and make their situation our own. The way the American people did while watching the Hurricane Katrina victims and the way Lincoln did when he came eye to eye with shackled slaves. To call upon this inborn capacity can only be to any society's advantage. That's why this book had a profound effect on me. And I'm going to be thinking differently in the future about how I look at leadership and how I lead my life and the decisions that I make in terms of how that might impact on others around the world. It's all for all of us. This is not about telling other people what to do. This is for all of us to make our own personal choices. But it just strikes me that if we all do that, then we can express empathy and not just express it, but we can put it into action. <laughs>